So welcome to University College Cork Global Speaker Series. My name is John O'Hara and I have the privilege of being the interim president of University College Cork. I'm a proud UCC alumnus and we're really excited to have you joining us here this evening. Throughout 2021, we'll bring a series of conversations into your room from places afar. One of the great joys of online is of course that we can reach right broadly across the world to enable great conversations to happen. In these conversations, we'll have someone facilitating the conversation, exploring both the challenges and the opportunities facing the world in which we're in today, whether it's COVID, whether it's climate change, or the significant geopolitical changes which are happening across the world. Each month, an expert from our global alumni community will discuss this topic, and I hope that you will find it interesting. And really what we're trying to do is to connect you across the world on these amazing topics. What we'd like to do is to explore during these conversations what has happened in the past year, what have we learned, what might we hold on to, or indeed what we might change and not go back to in this very difficult period for our history. What I'd like you to do is to enjoy the series um, and I hope that you become inspired by the conversations. And I want to thank the speakers and our facilitators for sharing your time, sharing your, sharing your expertise, sharing your encouraging and creative practice. And we look forward to having a wonderful series of conversations. Thank you for joining us today and I wish you well. Welcome to the sixth conversation in UCC's Global Speaker Series. We're delighted to welcome our distinguished guests this evening. Ambassador Maeve Collins is Ireland's Deputy permanent representative to the, e, to, the, to the European Union, one of the pivotal positions in the EU's decision-making system, which prepares the work of six EU Council configurations covering internal market, social, economic and environmental questions. It requires working across government to ensure coherence on all matters coming before the EU's Council of Ministers and negotiating with the Commission and with the other EU member states to ensure that Ireland's interests and values are preserved and progressed. Prior to taking up this post, Maeve was Ireland's ambassador to Finland from 2017 to 2019. Maeve has been the regional director to the Asia Pacific region and the senior official for the Asia Europe meeting from 2014 to 2017. She also served in Japan and Vietnam between 2007 and 2014. Maeve has worked on the Northern Ireland peace process in Dublin and in Belfast. Maeve first joined Ireland's Department of Foreign Affairs in 1990, and she has worked in Ireland's embassies in Bern, Ottawa, Hanoi and Helsinki. She has held leadership roles in the delegation of the European Union in Tokyo and the British-Irish Intergovernmental Secretariat in Belfast. Maeve is originally from Cork. She's a graduate of UCC and also a graduate of the Honourable Society of King's Inns in Dublin and the University of Ottawa. Dr. Jean Van Sindren Law is Associate Vice President in UCC and Director of European Relations and Public Affairs with responsibility for establishing key partnerships for the university with um, the European institutions, with other universities, with governments and agencies to ensure that UCC's research, education and public engagement missions are advanced. She is currently director in UCC of the European University of Post-Industrial Cities. Jean has held roles in UCC in which she and various teams have generated income of approximately 200 million euro for the university over a 20 year period. She was the Women Mean Business, Businesswoman of the Year in 2010, and a co-founder, a founding member of the European Commission's Marie Curie Fellows Fellowship Association and the European Association of Research Managers and Administrators. Jean has been a governor of UCC and a member of the Senate of the NUI. She serves on several boards and has considerable experience in film, television and theatre. This evening, our speakers are going to discuss the role, the role of Ireland in Europe and a changing world. 
a very warm welcome to you both. Thank you very much. Gurus Mila Mahagut Taran. Agus Hofford Road Maeve. Maeve this morning or Dumsa they kind of and show her nona. Lovely to meet you, Maeve. I just uh, <laughs> I'm thinking back, Maeve, that the first time I met you was when you were Ireland's ambassador to Vietnam. And you visited us in University College Cork from Hanoi. And there was some time between 2007 and 2014. And I was really, really impressed by this fascinating role and a fellow UCC alumna who had that role. So will you take us back, Maeve, to your time as a student in UCC, what you studied here, and how is it that you are now one of our prime representatives of this country um, overseas? Um, thanks very much, Jean, and it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Um, as you said, I, I did law in UCC. I'm a Cork uh, native, uh, went to school in Cork City in, in St. Angeles, uh, up, on the, up on the hill across town, um, and then studied law. I, 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 during those studies, I, I became aware of um, the possibilities open through what was called the Third Secretary Competition. Um, mainly because a, 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 a guy who was a few years ahead of us in college, um, a guy called Michael Walsh, who was, I think, the auditor of the Law Society then, he um, had got um, accepted into the Department of Foreign Affairs. He'd been successful with the exam and um, there was a tremendous chat uh, in the college bar and the library and all around what this job might mean. And I, I do remember thinking, I could probably do that because... I, I had languages and I already knew that I, I liked to travel and didn't necessarily want to spend the rest of my of my life in, in Cork or in Ireland. So um, at, now at that time, it was in the 80s and there was a civil service embargo. Um, and the following year, there was no third secretary competition and there was there was none at all really until um, until 1990 when I was getting ready um, to uh, to do King's Inns. And as, as luck would have it, uh, I was sharing a house with a couple of fellow students and somebody brought home a sheaf of application forms for the civil service because we were all worried about the, the prospects of starvation once we uh, once we were called to the bar. So anyway, a lot of us filled in those forms and I sat a series of exams and interviews. And I, I, I mean, I was, I was quite innocent about the process because even at the, the very final interview and when they were phoning to offer me the post when I was on a summer job in Cambridge, it still actually didn't occur to me that I was actually going to get a real job at the end. <laughs> <laughs> all of all of this, but uh, that's uh, that's that's how it turned out. And um, I joined the Department of Foreign Affairs in 1990, still thinking that I'd give it a year or two and then probably go back down the bar or do something else. But I, I think the department, um, the department is never dull. And I, you know, I never have had a boring job. And you always, I think, want to see what happens next um, in terms of the, the, the issues and the, the files that you're you're following. And I, I enjoyed it. And I suppose, you know, I, I grew up there professionally as well. So it's um, it, it, it's now really a second home in, in many ways to me. But you studied law and there is no doubt that your degree is very important to you in the work that you do now. So, you know, if you can... I think explain in the first instance, you are an ambassador based in Ireland's permanent representation to the European Union and of our 80 overseas missions, you know, this is the biggest mission, the biggest representation and representing Ireland's 5 million citizens and our role in the European Union. So the role you now have is a multi-relationship role, presumably, but clearly, because you're heavily involved in lawmaking, your degree must stand to you every day. Um, yes, that uh, is true. The, the degree has stood to me um, in, in ways that I didn't really expect at all at the time. I mean, how, how, how would you really? But um, I, I suppose I first 
heard of, of Cora Curran, the Committee of Permanent Representatives in, um, in Brian McMahon's uh, uh, law class a long time ago I, during EU law. Um, and uh, then again at King's Inns, where, where it was also mandatory to take a course in. It was EC law then, of course, not, not European Union law. Um, and it still uh, sometimes astonishes me to, to find myself a member of, of, of that committee, which prepares the lawmaking work of the Council of Ministers uh, of the EU. And we meet uh, sometimes weekly, sometimes twice weekly, and sometimes more often during periods of crisis. And we we progress all of the work that will be dealt with, with by a series of different ministers from all of our governments um, in, in hammering out the, the regulations, the directives, the recommendations, the council conclusions that sometimes give rise to legislation. Um, and we, we, we do that every week, working also with the Commission and with the member state who holds the six-month presidency of the EU, who, who chairs the work uh, of, of all of the Union, um, of the, the internal work of the Union for six months and tries to move these legislative files forward as efficiently as possible, which is not so always very good. But I, I, can, I can imagine... But working with the so you're obviously working with each of the European institutions. Um, we work with the European Commission very closely, and also with the um, European Parliament, which and that is something that certainly has changed a lot since I studied law with um, with Brian McMahon. Is the importance of the of the European Parliament in in the legislative process, and we also work with a, a, what is called the Council Secretariat which is a standing body of officials from member states which supports the work uh, of the council uh, and in particular the work of the of the presidency um, on on its lawmaking activities and policy activities and Maeve, what is the process of lawmaking it is a complex one i i probably will not surprise you um it is governed by the the treaties uh the treaty on the european union which it, which assigns powers and competences to the eu as the member states agree so the eu for example has very and that would be really the commission which is the guardian of the treaty and really the the engine of of eu legislation in areas where it has competence the the internal market would be one example of where um the, the european union has extensive powers and competence and the commission sometimes on the recommendation of the Council of Ministers, sometimes on its own initiative, can bring forward proposals for a legislation. And these are then examined um, inch by inch, word by word, by a series of technical working parties that are made up of technical experts from each of the member states. And they go through and negotiate line by line. And eventually, um, when those files are ready, they come in to um, to what is called CORACR, the Committee of Permanent Representatives, uh, which I am part of, and which our permanent representative is part of for the other series of councils. And we then examine whether we can reach what is called um, a general approach, which can be approved by ministers or sometimes negotiated further by ministers if we can't, if there are items that are too politically sensitive in it. Once the ministers have reached that general approach, the presidency can then go to the European Parliament and take uh, uh, negotiations further. And eventually, from those negotiations between the Council, the Commission and the Parliament, a law that all of those institutions um, can sign up to uh, is is agreed and brought into force. Now I can uh, I can go into an awful lot more detail, but I think uh, you, you might be better doing a night course <laughs> but also in UCC to get the uh, to get the real uh, the real details of how that works. Uh, but but maybe you, 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 you view of, of how it works. 
but, but, but it's, you, you clearly illustrated the interactivity between the institutions and the amount of consultation which takes place through the permanent representatives, the institutions, and obviously the member states. And as you said, every line has gone through. So there's there's um there's a huge opportunity to feed in. Uh, on that, actually, how can European citizens um feed into that process? What through what structures? Um well, there are actually quite a lot of structures. And um, the first thing is that European citizens are represented by their governments and by ministers in the council. Um, and certainly in Ireland, our government is, is quite accessible to citizens, either via TDs, senators and councillors, or simply um, simply by writing or, or emailing them. Um, there often is a consultation, it, it, particularly on technical and sectoral pieces of legislation. Government departments will run public consultations beforehand. Um, for example, on, on artificial intelligence uh, recently, um, uh, or the commission will run one as well, uh, where they will invite submissions from members of the public and from expert bodies and NGOs and lobbyists. So that's that's one way. The other thing, obviously, is through the, the European Parliament in that people um, people vote for their MEPs. And, you know, it is it is good for people to be aware that their, their MEPs also play a very important role in this process. And again, I my experience is that most of our, if not all of our members of the European Parliament tend to be very accessible to their uh, constituents, uh, whether through their offices or again online, phone, or through social media. And can you comment on the 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 conference on the future of Europe? And um, the conference on the future of Europe, which has just launched, is an initiative um, very much led by France, but supported by all of the member states to get citizens' views across the Union on the direction of travel um, for the EU in the coming decade. I think it's probably, it was conceived before the pandemic, but I think working in the times that we've had in the last year will, will probably shape the outcome quite considerably, probably in different ways than were expected at the start. So that process has just uh, been set up. We're represented on it both at political level and there are two citizens representatives uh, in a forum as well. They drew uh, in part uh, some inspiration from the Irish model of the, uh, the Citizens Assembly to discuss constitutional change. So there is there is very definitely uh, a strong Irish influence in, in the shape uh, of, of the Conference on the Future of Europe. And it's going to meet and discuss, um, it's just, still getting off the ground we are hoping that it's going to be possible for the citizens representatives to all meet in person before long but obviously we have to see what the public health situation will allow and of course the irish and um, citizens assembly that you referred to there chaired by the governor or the um, chairman of the governing authority of university college cork um dr catherine day so and which brings me actually two questions made that i have one is I'm very keen to hear what are the what are the files on your desk at present? The kind of most pressing um, um, subjects that are the basis of lawmaking right now, and then we move on to the influence of the Irish and the roles that that, that Irish leadership has, despite our 1.1 percent of the European population. I think we punch well above our weight, so you might come to that secondly. Um, the files on on my desk at the moment that are going to take up a lot of time in the coming year, I think, well, on, on everyone's desk is the, the whole question of what we hope is now the final stage of the pandemic, but we don't know for sure yet, um, and how to, how, how to build back better after that. Um, we've had to work very hard. We've had to suspend, in some cases, a lot of the rules relating to the budgets and the internal market to handle and to remain resilient to the pandemic. So we have to ensure that we go back um, to those rules at the right time and in the right way. 
but there are a number of other files that are, are, are going to also take up a lot of time. On the environmental and climate side, we're expecting an enormous suite of legislation um, as we move towards uh, a carbon neutral um, EU by 2050. And there is a commitment to reduce the carbon emissions across the EU by 55% uh, in 2030. So the Commission is going to bring forward a suite of proposals in July. And I can tell you, Jean, that that, that is going to take up uh, an enormous amount of our time in, in the coming year or two. Um, secondly, we're looking always in Ireland in particular at ways to improve the functioning of the single market, whether it is the single market for goods or services. And currently, um, there are also legislative measures re relating to digital services and digital platforms, which are coming across my desk. And they are going to be, um, again, they are very complicated, very multifaceted, and um, will have huge impact for citizens and for businesses in, in Ireland. Um, we're also looking at quite a wide range of, of other things, whether it's... Um, whether it's transport, whether it's education and health is increasingly taking up uh, a lot of our time. I mean, uh, we will in the autumn be examining how to strengthen both the European Medicines Agency and the European Centre for Disease Control in light of what we've learned from the pandemic. So it's nothing uh, terribly uh, exciting a lot of the time, but it, it does actually make a, a big difference to citizens' lives and uh, the quality of their lives. So, you know, we we, we take it very seriously and um, it, it, it occupies time across nearly every government department uh, in, in, in Ireland. So, so that, that, that legislative package that you referred to, the uh, Fit for 55, um, which, as you said, is very complex and there's a whole lot to it, will there be very significant implications are Irish businesses in that? Um, there will be both opportunities and there will also be probably difficult decisions for Ireland and for our, for sectors of our economy in that package. Um, we will be, obviously we don't have a heavy industry base, so we don't actually have a high emissions profile in terms of carbon, but we do have a high emissions profile on methane. So how we, um, how we ensure that we fulfill our obligations is going to be quite a difficult question for us. Uh, there is a commitment in the programme for government, um, uh, quite a number of commitments in relation to environment and climate and to land use and to re-examining how we use land in a way that can absorb carbon better and reduce the number of emissions. So that, that will certainly be part of it. But it, it, it encompasses everything um, from the, the circular economy, from green uh, public procurement, uh, to how we tax um, energy, which is also going to be a very um, tricky and, and difficult question for, for all member states. And um, also we will be looking at transport, how to incentivize public transport, how to ensure that the carbon dioxide emissions of cars are really greatly reduced and the carbon footprint of car manufacturing uh, is best. So it's um, it's it's a big it's a big one it's complex and, and far-reaching you know and you have very significant changes even when you refer to public transport and incentivizing it you know to see a major shift in that in this yeah. country would be would be very significant and in, indeed very welcome um go back to that just question of leadership irish leadership in europe um I think we're doing well, some of our representatives, in other words, you know, as we, we were chatting about, you know, the, the Eurogroup, um, but that's headed up by Pascal Donoghue um, and our commissioner, Maureen McGuinness. So as a small nation, I think we are doing well in leadership. Would you agree, Maeve? Um, I would agree. I think that Ireland has generally a very good track record of um what we have contributed to the EU institutions. Um, you know, the, the Erasmus Plus 
uh, the Erasmus scheme, which I, I'm sure you're you're more than familiar with in UCC in a university um, and is one of the EU's most popular flagship programs was, was set up by Peter Sutherland when, when he was our commissioner. And, uh, you know, that has been a transformative one. We've had two former secretaries general of the commission, Catherine Day, who you mentioned earlier, and uh, David O'Sullivan um, have both held those positions. And David was also the chief operating officer of the European External Action Service. So we, we also have a, a lot of other uh, Irish citizens and graduates in um, the EU institutions doing very good work who are obviously not as high profile or, or publicly known. Um, and I, I would at this point just plug the government's EU jobs strategy because um, we are facing a demographic cliff in the coming years as some of those Irish officials begin to approach retirement. So the government is uh, has just launched a strategy to try and improve the uh, the proportion of Irish uh, people in both the European Commission, the Council and the Parliament. Um, and I would encourage anyone who is interested to, uh, to, to check that out on the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, websites. And there are a very wide range of jobs available, whether you're a pharmacist, a lawyer, a vet, um, a linguist, an economist, um, there, there are, are huge opportunities to, you know, to serve the citizens of, of this 450 odd million uh, uh, person union that we have. And um, um, how is it that there has been um, a drop in, you know, in, 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 in people seeking careers in Europe? Um, I think, Jean, there are there are both probably positive and negative reasons for it. Um, uh, firstly, the union enlarged quite a lot in recent years. We have had new member states joining. So specific competitions were held to recruit citizens from those member states to ensure that that balance of nationality remained um, in the institutions. So there wasn't as, as big a drive to recruit citizens from the older member states. Um, I think, secondly, um, which is another positive, that the, the range of jobs available to Irish graduates with languages and skills um, in Ireland and, you know, even outside the EU has, uh, has increased enormously mm -hmm. in, in recent years. And then maybe on a more negative uh, sense, I think we have maybe not done as much as we used to or not as much as we should have on uh, foreign language learning in particular and on on awareness raising of of how the union works, what it does for citizens, and um, you know why why it is a good idea to speak at least one language other than your own. And you spoke what the union means to people and what it has done for us. So we're almost coming to I think fifty years or so since we joined in seventy three. So if you were to to and it's a pivotal moment, you look at it, you know, 50 years later, where are we going next? So to ask you, what is what is the future for Ireland in the European Union? And also the great benefits of having been a member? Um, if you, if you, well, if you were asked, my personal view, one of the great benefits that we've got um, has been equality between men and women. I think um, our, our, that was accelerated enormously by our membership of the, the EEC. And uh, I, for me, if you, it, that would be probably the, the one thing that I would immediately uh, think of. Of course, there are other benefits. So the, the access to the single market for Irish exporters and businesses has transformed our economy. Um, and we were, I, I suppose we were forced in a way to, to modernize and to review and to update our legislation over the years. That wasn't always easy, but um, it, it undoubtedly has been of huge benefit. I think from the point of view of the environment, um, again, we, we are not in anything approaching a race to the top, the, the bottom. We're more like in a race to the top. 
for the EU to be, you know, the most environmentally friendly and the 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 best for environmental governance and regulation. And I think it is in very very much to our benefit that we are part of that. Um, as regards what the future holds, um. I mean, I would hope that what it, it holds for us is a union which continues to have peace and friendship between all of its member states, that continues to adhere to democratic values and to inclusion. Um, I would very much hope and expect that it will um, involve not just prosperity for its citizens, but for a shared prosperity for its citizens, that we, we continue to do more to ensure that those regions, which are not as well off um, as we now are, um, benefit from, um, from membership. And I think, I hope that we will be known as um, a country, or rather a, a country within a union where standards of education, standards of health, standards of democratic participation and social safety nets um, are, are very high and uh, and strong. So that, that's certainly, I'm speaking now not so much as, as a diplomat or as an ambassador, but certainly that is what I, as a as a citizen of the European Union, want want for its future. And of course... Uh, yeah. the to the conference uh, on the future of Europe are listening to the... <laughs> <laughs> And maybe if you think about it during the pandemic and the ability, you know, that we, we were part of, of the European Union, the negotiation for vaccines. Um, yes. That has had a very significant impact. Yes, obviously. it has. Um, well, I mean, it has, of course, been an enormously difficult and painful year for, uh, I mean, everyone, and obviously some far more so than others. Um, and it has seen the European Union at the at the heart of um, of progress on this, and also obviously not without controversy as well. I certainly think that without having the the muscle of the European Union to negotiate the purchase of vaccines, it would have been very difficult for a lot of the member states to negotiate the prices and the access that we got um, to the vaccines and the rope to be able to roll out those vaccines as we have done, um, you know, and, and I, I think that that is something that will certainly stand the test of time. I also think it's important to note that, um, that the EU has not blocked the exports of any vaccines. We have continued to export vaccines and we will continue to share vaccines with countries that uh, that need them and that is every bit as important as vaccinating our own citizens and um, also i think in terms of vaccine development we've we've seen um some of the benefits of massive investments in research and education uh, you know i mean just thinking I, my my own vaccine has been the biontech uh, um the, the, the german turkish um uh, research which which led to um the the pfizer vaccine and we've also seen the benefits of academic research and collaboration and industrial research and collaboration with, for example, the US, again, um, on the on the mRNA vaccines, which, which has been crucial. And I, I would have to say the, the US venture capital uh, environment as well, which allowed a lot of those vaccines to be developed and go forward. So, I mean, on, on that note, relating to education and research, to be connected across the union, is very important and then for the union to be connected across the globe mm. so yes. the future of the european higher education area or the european research area there's a lot of talk and change afoot um does any of that mm. you come across are you involved in any in any discussion not so much discussions but um yeah i, I suppose council decisions recommendations to the commission and so on they are obviously um part of your concern as well um, yes, they are. So um, the corporate one, which I sit on, also prepares the work of the Education Council and um, the, um, the the Research Council. So um, really in the last year, um, once the, the overall EU budget for the next seven years uh, was approved, um, we have worked through and ministers have essentially signed off into law the, the next 
Erasmus package, which is greatly increased funding, and uh, which will extend beyond universities as well. Um, it will extend to an extent to secondary education, but also to vocational and technical education and to um, improved linkages uh, between teachers and professors uh, on their development. And we've also um, approved the, 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 the very big um, Horizon uh, programme, Horizon Europe, which is uh, huge funding for research and very prestigious research and research that is is founded on the principles of collaboration and centres of excellence um, across, across the union. And of course, there's also stimulus in there for, for us to engage outside of the union and, and with our global partners. So, Absolutely, yeah. I should have said that. There certainly is, and that is also a very important part of it, um, is, is that engagement with, with like-minded um, partners across the globe. Um, Brexit, obviously you were heavily involved in negotiations, discussions and so on. Can you focus a bit on the opportunities for Ireland? Um, okay, I can. I'm not actually directly involved in 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 Brexit negotiations right now. I should add, um, but obviously there are implications for the areas that that we deal with because of Brexit. Um, I am not a big subscriber to the. There are lots of opportunities arising. <laughs> Out of Brexit, I, I regret it very much and think, uh, you know, I still feel some sadness that we don't have our UK colleagues with us. Um, I feel some personal sadness because a lot of my family um, live in the UK and um, I, I, I think it is really something that is, there's, there's not a lot of cheerful things to say about it. Um, I would say that um, it has, of course, uh, you know, made us um, ever more appreciative of the solidarity that we've received from the 26 EU member states. It's made us very aware of the benefits of belonging um, to the single market, of how, what, you know, the, the great advantages of having diversified our, our trade over the years um, in a way that means we're not dependent on one market um, or one set of consumers. Um, we possibly, a lot of people say, oh, you must have an advantage now that you're the, the only English speakers in the union. That's, I'm not convinced that there's, um, that that's really the case. I, I think that quite a lot of the other member states standards of English are also excellent and so on. Um, I, I mean, I would hope that it has, um, we will remain on good terms with the UK. It's been a very difficult couple of months. I think Ireland, um, of course, has been particularly badly affected by Brexit, but we are also, you know, determined that we will um, build things back um, and that we will uh, certainly remain um, friendly and um, in, in, in close connection with our nearest neighbour. And of course, the peace process um, in the North um, will be first and foremost our priority, that that is safeguarded um, throughout every discussion. Maeve, there are a lot of questions coming in and um, quite a few of them focused on democracy and you know, rule of law and you know, um, any comments you'd like to make on that. Um, the, there's also a question relating to alliances, countries forming alliances, like the, the Baltic states and the Visegrad group. And what does that, you know, should we be involved in more alliances or not? So the first one is the, um, the democracy, di di different levels of democracy in countries, members of the Union, and then the second one relating to alliances. Okay, um, thank you. Well, look, the, the rule of law is a very big concern and um, it um, occupies certainly the, 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 the minds and the time of, um, of our ministers um, and our citizens, clearly, from the, the questions uh, that you've raised. There is 
um, a whole rule of law mechanism in the Treaty on the European Union, whereby all member states are subject to an evaluation by the Commission. And Ireland was um, last April, for example. So we support that and we participate in it and we respond, um, we hope, constructively and positively to criticisms, which are often valid criticisms that are made. We know that there are a number of member states where there are serious concerns, um, for example, around the independence of the judiciary. And there are difficult conversations at ministerial level, and there are difficult processes underway at the moment. And in all of these, Ireland has been a very strong contributor and voice um, in support of the rule of law, and also uh, in support of an independent judiciary and inclusive societies um, which respect the rights of LGBTQI plus uh, persons. Um, I, I can't say how this is going to play out, but we hope that it will play out in, in the emergence of, of improved um, human rights protection um, in all of those member states. And the, the particular alliances? Um, that has come into focus more um, since the the UK referendum in um, in in 2016. Um, there there are a number of groupings within the European Union um, which work very closely together. One is the the Visegrad countries um, of uh, Eastern Europe, as well former Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, the other is the Nordic Baltic countries. Um, the six of those. And uh, I see the question relates to Ireland's positioning um, in relation to that. We are very close to the Nordic Baltic groups. There's a group called the Nordic Baltic Plus, which includes Ireland and the Netherlands on um, some financial and economic uh, matters, and which meets often at the level of, of Prime Minister or Taoiseach. Um, Ireland, we also work very closely with other member states, either on issues where we're like-minded, like um, digital, we are a member of a group known as the Digital Nine, which are, it's in fact now 10, of course, this is, that's the EU for you, um, of countries which prioritize um, the transition to a digital economy. And um, we also work very closely from time to time with other island or, or near island as their uh, member states. So um, Cyprus and Malta, and ourselves and occasionally from time to time Finland or Portugal are you know we are peripheral countries that have particular challenges um, in relation to transport, uh, aviation, um, road haulage and we, we certainly would, would work quite closely with, uh, with them on issues. So uh, the alliances are, uh, alliance building is, uh, is a daily occupation for us here in Brussels and they, they they change depending on on what file or what issue we're looking at. As I say it's all it's all about relationships Maeve. It is. <laughs> the, the membership of the UN Security Council, a few questions in on that. Um, what do we need to stress most now that we are um, the EU is not a member of the Security Council, but Ireland is at present a member of the Security Council. And um, since the UK left um, Ireland, along with France, we, we are the only uh, two EU member states that are currently on the Security Council. So that is obviously a big responsibility um, for us there, which um, my colleagues who work both uh, in New York and Geneva and in Dublin on the UN are, are really fully engaged on. And indeed, our, our ministers, uh, in particular Minister Coveney, are, are very active on. Um, we have, what we have stressed the most during our time on the UN Security Council is I think what we, um, what we promised during our campaign to be on the Security Council, which is um, partnership, commitment to the rule of law, to governance, and to greater equity for the planet. So, um, you know, we are also working on a number of quite important files uh, there. So the, the Syria question, for example, we, we are a uh, holder on, and I know we have been very active on the 
the events in Ethiopia as well. I, I should say at this point, though, that I am I am not a UN expert or engaged on anything to do with our our SECO campaign. And I, but I'd highly recommend you you ask another one of my colleagues, perhaps, to, to speak to you about to that. Our permanent rep in the UN. Um, Maeve, cultures that you've worked across cultures. You've you've lived in Finland, Vietnam, Japan, Switzerland, now Belgium, um, and that sense of um, cultural identity, and the fact that well, national identities, and the fact that culture is a great way of binding and connecting. Um, would you would you very much subscribe to that or would you say yes i would uh i would i would say it's um it's a very important tool for our diplomacy as well is is the promotion of our own culture and also uh demonstrating an appreciation and understanding of the culture of other countries and indeed also projecting the fact that we, we have become a much more multicultural society ourselves since uh, since the since the foundation of the state. Um, I think our our artists and our our performers and our, our creative community um, they've had a very difficult time in the last year as they have in so many other parts of the world and we've, we've never needed them more at the same time. Um, I know that within the EU there is certainly there is some funding and nationally also being made available to try and ensure that the cultural community recovers better from the pandemic. Um, I, I hope that it will be sufficient. I, I mean, I think also it's been remarkable to see uh, how some culture has been able to shift online. And um, I, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's very much looking forward to getting back to a live performance, whether it's a play or a concert uh, before, before too long. Um, there's really nothing like it. But I think it is a very important tool just for, um, mm -hmm. For binding people together and for um, for introducing ourselves to other countries, and um, I think we maybe also have to guard against uh, a hierarchy of of culture. My my time in Japan taught me that a lot of um, the newer art forms, digital arts, anime, um, you know, computer games, gaming are you know they're, they're hugely important creative industry for Ireland and say for, for Japan as well. And they bring people of all generations, but particularly young people, together in a way that just um that just wasn't possible when when I was their age. Well it, it has changed dramatically and um and where those creative skills now have to come to bear and you talk about the digital connectivity um and that gaming world so many people have stayed very connected because they are engaged during mm -hmm. lockdown so it's interesting some things that we couldn't that we certainly wouldn't have seen um um as being positive you know there was a time where we thought that 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 a level of engagement with computers and screening and all that wasn't that great but it becomes that is the way of the of the world now, and, and has been a, a great um, root of 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 I suppose, support for people during lockdown because none of us could have envisaged a global um, um, lockdown. Oh. And maybe in the in the final few few minutes, um, going back is a lot of questions relating to the role of a diplomat and what are the skill sets? Not necessarily your skill sets, you have them in spades, but if you were to say generically, this is the type of person who should consider a career as a diplomat, these are the key skill sets. Um, uh, yes, I, well, I would say we need a broad skill set and that no one person has them all. Um, and the more diverse your foreign ministry and foreign service is, uh, the better it will function. That's, I think, the first thing to say. So, um, I, I, you know, we, 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 we should never say that there is just one type of person or one set of skills. Um, however, of course, uh, it is an advantage to have foreign languages still. Um, you should enjoy travel. 
that's um, a big part of it. You, you can't do diplomacy sitting in your capital. Um, and I, I would say also uh, a, a, a bit of resilience, uh, a willingness to eat anything uh, <laughs> has, has taken me uh, has taken me a long way. And I suppose a, a curiosity and an understanding of how the world works, and and a willingness to to admit that maybe you don't understand how a lot of parts of the world work, but to be curious to learn more and open to um, to listening and hearing from others uh, as to, to what, their, what their concerns are and how, how they see things. I think that, that's a key word is to be curious mm. and, and curious about the world and curious about everything and it carries you a long way. Um, my final question, Maeve, is a big one really, but Europe's role globally. So mm. as a block in a, glo in, in a global context. Can you comment on, on the future, you know, the importance of that? Um, I can. I, uh, the question probably relates to Europe as a foreign policy actor. Um, but Europe's role globally goes a bit beyond that as well. So Europe is already a global player economically. Um, because of that single market that we that we have for goods and services, um, Europe, I think, is already a global player as a regulator, which maybe a lot of people don't think about. But the GDPR legislation, which was again a long, tough battle uh, through various committees in Europe, that is now seen as as the gold standard for data regulation, and I think. The, the Europe will continue to set those standards, whether it's environmental, consumer protection, health, um, or data governance, or indeed AI governance as well. So, in that sense, it will it will certainly have a global role. Europe is, I think, an underappreciated actor uh, as a global um, development funder. So, the EU itself has a very generous development assistance program which is deployed um, for the benefit of the poorer countries of the world and um, again certainly I think it would be an Irish priority to see that uh, that role develop and grow and um, it continues to be an aspiration of many of our neighboring countries to become a member of the European Union and I think that is really a tribute both to the, the, the shared prosperity for, for those who live within its borders and to the freedoms that we enjoy as citizens and, and the democratic protections. So I, I would hope that that will in particular continue uh, and that Europe will be seen as a global player simply by virtue of the fact that there, there are other countries, many other countries who, who want to join or in other parts of the world to replicate what we have. As regards its role as a foreign policy, um, this is a, a actor that is a somewhat more complicated, but Europe is a, is a voice on the global stage on many issues. Um, climate is one of them, where we, we play a very active role. Trade is another in the, in the international rules-based area. And on foreign policy issues such as um, human rights, the EU traditionally has been a very strong player. It, our, what can hold us back, of course, is that we have to proceed by consensus. And when you have 27 member states trying to agree uh, the finer points of a foreign policy, it is not as fast or as agile as one single country, um, which has uh, some executive powers in relation to foreign policy that the EU simply doesn't have. So I, I hope that to some extent answers the question. A lot of these questions, uh, you know, you could probably have a lecture by somebody far better reform than me that would go on for several hours and still not answer completely. Well, well, maybe this is just a very short time, but it is certainly given, I, I, I find it fascinating, really, really interesting to, to be in conversation with you. And you have given us a sense of the scale and breadth of your current posting, and um, in in chatting with you, it's clear that our that Ireland has been very well represented and will continue to be well represented by you and your colleagues. 
And of course, who knows what's next for Ambassador Maeve Collins. But for the moment, just on behalf of University College Cork, um, of which you, it is very proud of you as an alumna, um, I want to thank you and on behalf of the listeners for taking the time to have this conversation and to wish you continued success. And you've got a great joie de vivre which I think you probably bring in brokering all those global relationships, which you do so efficiently and effectively, and with a very keen, um, specifically legal brain. So thank you very, very much. And I'll give you the last word, but then, and then we'll go back and invite our colleague, uh, Karen Kelly, to address the audience. Well, I would just like to say thank you, Jean, and it was, uh, it was an honor to be asked um, to do this, um, this, this conversation with you. And, it's great to be able to do it online, um, but I'm really looking forward to uh, being able to get back uh, to to Cork in person. I hope uh, before the uh, before the the end of the summer. And I must say, I'm I'm very proud to be um, to be a UCC graduate, um, and I, I always look back very fondly on my time there. And um, you know, not just the lectures, but the 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 friendships and the fun that we had uh, back then. So I wish you all the best. And um, I hope that this will have been of, uh, of interest to, um, to, to, to some of the fellow, fellow graduates out there. What a pity I, that we can't it, interact. Well, when, when we see the number of applicants for jobs in Europe, you know, um, ex growing exponentially over the next while with all the, um, with, the with UCC as their alma maters, we know that it had, had impact. So thank you, Maeve. And Karen, um, welcome back. I now see the two uh, pictures in front of me. Yeah, so thank you very much, Maeve and Jean. That was a really interesting insight into Ireland within the EU and the workings of the institutions um, and just a fascinating discussion about the various opportunities and challenges that lie ahead for Ireland and Europe. Um, I'd also like to thank all our all our viewers. The Global Speaker Series will return in the autumn and we'll be in touch with everyone to let you know about the next talk. And just finally, I'd like to thank our speakers again this evening. You were, you were fantastic and wishing you a lovely evening and a very nice summer.